Hello and welcome to part three on our lecture series on the Renaissance here on learning the social sciences. Today we're going to be focusing on the art of the Italian Renaissance. Now, of course, there is a reason why we have this explosion. We have a lot more money available in Italy to be able to be used to give to the artists. The system of patronage is big. And we have the old elite, the new elite. We have the fat people, as they were called, the Popolo Grasso, who were the nobility, those wealthy merchants and manufacturers. And they were roughly 5% of the population. They were a group of people that could afford to have individual paintings made of themselves and their family members, but also to commission large paintings that could better their city and also just show the city their wealth and their status. Status is a big thing back then. We even have the book, um, the book of the courtier, which expressed the perfect nobleman, that they have this impeccable character, this grace and talent, of course, that noble birth, and that their, their profession um, has roots in military service, trying to go grab from the old classical medieval knight status, but also recognizing that they now have a classical education, that they are now immersed in the humanities. And so times are changing a bit in that way. Now, in terms of this Renaissance thought that is going to be impacting the art and writing of the era, of course, we go back to ancient Greece and we grab from the old writings of Homer, Plato, and Aristotle. Building upon that, we have humanism, the study of the liberal arts, where we are going and jumping in to more than just the old majors of law, medicine, and theology, but we're going into logic. We're going into like geometry, music, astronomy, rhetoric. Uh, we are going and learning the art of living. And of course, humanism, which we can go back to the father of humanism, patriarch, and go and see how we now can kind of start to exit from being so tied to the church with all of our themes, but we don't have to exit the church all the way. Um, we can just go off and start doing kind of our own independent thinking. We also, during this era, have the Renaissance men. Now, what is this for a term? Well, it is this person who has this broad knowledge of many things and in different fields. They are somebody that can also link the different fields together, transferable knowledge. They are the Greek ideal of the well-rounded man. And they're somebody that also has to have good character. Um, and the apex of that is usually known for in terms of the talent and giftedness is Leonardo da Vinci, who we'll be talking about here in a minute. Uh, for women during the Renaissance, although we do have some standout females like Isabella de Esti, the lot doesn't change for them. Legally, they're subordinate to their husbands and their fathers. Um, families have to pay a dowry when they want to get married. And because of this financial burden, some families, when they have a baby girl, they leave them out to be exposed. Or when their girl daughter becomes like 14, 15, that age where you're kind of like, now what are we going to be doing here? And they know they don't have the money. They then send them to a convent to be a nun because they don't have the money for a dowry. They don't have the money for them to go get married. Some women go and work for their own dowry. They might become a domestic servant, something like that, so that they can get married around that average age of marriage, around the age of 20. Now, for themselves, their husband might actually be in their 40s when they get married because he has to also establish himself first. Um, and so because of this, we do have some other issues going on um, in Italy, like with prostitution. Um, but yeah, that is just kind of how it is during this time period for women. It is not like a great enlightenment age for them and where they can come out. That is why like Isabella de Esti is a standout figure because she was given a very good education, unlike other people. Now, in terms of kind of the greats of the era, I'm going to actually start not in art, but in political science. 
we're going to start with Niccolo Machiavelli. Now, he is somebody who comes out from the Florence Republic during the time period when the Medicis were not in power and just crafting government, doing his job as a diplomat. Uh, however, the Medicis returned and he was thrown into prison. Uh, while he was in prison, uh, he wrote the book, The Prince, where he recommended um, temporary uses of brutality, ruthlessness, uh, fraud, whatever you could to maintain power as a ruler. He also was constantly, constantly pushing for Italian unity so that outside threats like from France would not be such a threat because if the Italians would unify, they could be a strong group of people. Now, although he did hope uh, for the strong ruler to come from the Medici family, um, he is somebody that then wrote down all the different reasons why one might kind of need to use some ruthless uh, tactics to maintain their power. Uh, he was an admirer of the old Roman rulers and this concept of citizenship and virtue, uh, where people would act heroically and decisively for the good of one's country. Um, but he is somebody who is coined with the phrase Machiavellianism or this ruthlessness from a leader because of the, the maintenance of that power that he said was okay from time to time. Now let's jump actually into the art, moving away from political science and the book, The Prince. So in terms of the art, what we're going to be seeing is the natural world coming to life in these paintings and human emotion coming to the faces of people within the artwork. We're going to be seeing linear perspective that uh, foreground and background coming out, symmetry, we're going to be having the shading and light and dark in contrast really jumping out at us. And so we're not going to be focusing on all of the different re Renaissance uh, individuals, but we are going to be focusing on some specific people. So in terms of what has come out in terms of medieval artwork to now Renaissance artwork, what I have just mentioned, that realism and expressionism that we can see in one of the very early Renaissance art artists, uh, Masaccio. Now, Masaccio, in his painting, The Expulsion from the Garden, where Adam and Eve are getting, well, as the title said, expelled from the Garden of Eden, uh, they are truly showing emotion on their faces. Adam is covering his face. Eve is just looking up um, and just mourning the loss of the garden. It also is bringing back the nudes that we haven't really seen in painting since the classical era. And so these are also coming back. Masaccio also is the person to really bring back linear perspective, to have that foreground and the background. And you see it in numerous pieces of artwork from this talented young painter. And I'm saying young painter because he does unfortunately die young in his 20s. In terms of classicalism coming back in, we have people going and doing items like uh, Greco-Roman statues, br bringing that back. Of course, we have that with the two different Davids. Yes, there's more than one. We have Donatello's Bronze David, and we have, of course, Michelangelo, Michelangelo's very famous marble David. Uh, but we are seeing this symmetry, this balance and old classical styles of art coming back. Also because of the Renaissance, we're having individualism come in. Why? People can afford it. People can afford to have a painting of just themselves or just their small intimate family. We are going to be having people be uh, kind of captured for all of time just as themselves not a whole group of people anymore. Um, we are going to be having plenty of money for this, uh, for people that you would not expect, people that are not royalty, people that simply have that money to be able to do that. And like I've also mentioned, we are going to be having this light and shadowing, the softening of the edges coming out in the paintings. We're going to have possibly like, for example, very popular in Venice, that darker background, and then like somebody's face coming out into the lightness uh, for uh, Renaissance artwork. 
So as I have mentioned, there is that it is individual, individual Isabella de Esti. She is known as the first lady of the Italian Renaissance. Why? She's a great patroness of the arts. Her parents gave her an education just like her brothers. And so she is highly gifted and talented. When she gets married, her husband, who is in charge of a city state in Italy, is often off at war because of just the time period they're in. And so she is basically ruling her city state in her her husband's absence and when he is captured she goes and negotiates for his release now when he does return he nah is not really that happy with the power of his wife so she goes down to rome for a period of time and that is when she meets a whole bunch of artists and starts to really be the true patroness of the renaissance uh giving money to some of the greats including leonardo da vinci she also is kind of known for being the first lady of the world when her husband died and her son took over she of course returns home and she then serves as a regent until her son is of age and when he did become of age the people were kind of like can we still have you for a little bit longer please please a little bit longer please um and she obliged and the son obliged uh, and she did rule for a little bit longer um but then eventually he does have to rule and then they give her her own city-state. It's a small little city-state, but to be able to rule over that. So Isabella, Isabella de Esti really goes down and showing what women in this era could do if they would be allotted a proper education. So jumping into the artists, we've already talked about the early artists of Masaccio, also the early artist of Donatello with him doing the Bronze David, bringing back those old classical uh, statues. But now we're going to be talking about bringing back that classical mythology that we had. And that is Sandro Botticelli in terms of truly, truly bringing that. Um, of course, he is very much known for doing his Birth of Venus uh, painting and then Primavera. Um, <clears throat> he is a painter that is based in Florence. And yes, he goes through this phase of having all of this mythological work within his paintings but he also is somebody who gets very much caught up by uh, Savonarola who um, comes in to Florence and speaks out against the whole Renaissance movement of humanism and calls it corrupt and immoral and he is somebody that then switches over to a religious aspect he doesn't ever drop the religious aspect like for example he has done paintings on a religious uh, nature before that but now he does actually take some of his paintings and throws them on the bonfire of the vanities himself so he is somebody that was caught up with that movement of course, Leonardo da Vinci is the ultimate Renaissance man because he was involved in so much. He is a great artist. In fact, when he went and painted two angels on a collaborative painting, his mentor, Verrocchio, gave up painting. He looked at what da Vinci had done with his two angels and he's like, nope, I'm done. That guy, great, great. Um, so he gives up. Um, but da Vinci is also a sculptor. He's an architect, an inventor, a scientist, an engineer. To go and see the human body, to paint it better, he goes and dissects humans. To be able to see that, he is thinking of flying machines. He is doing so much in terms of this era, which is why he is the ultimate Renaissance man. Of course, there's debate sometimes between him and Michelangelo, um, but... Da Vinci jumps into more fields than Michelangelo um, in terms of what he has done. And of course, um, he is very much known for the painting, the Mona Lisa, with that specific smile that Mona Lisa is given. Um, and yeah, just that contrast with the foreground, the background, the lighting, the shading, everything. It is also just that portrait that just symbolizes the era and where painting has come during the Renaissance. Now, Michelangelo uh, was somebody who was a sculptor, and that is what he wanted to do. He wanted to sculpt. And, of course, he is very much known for the David, the marble statue. However, you got to kind of sometimes do what you got to do to get, well, paid. Um, he also is a talented painter. And he is called to Rome to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And he does it. Um, it takes him years to do it. He rigs up his own scaffolding system that will hang from the side of the walls. Um, and it's backbreaking work. Why? Well, you're kind of lying there with your arm in the air painting. 
and with such great detail. Um, now, in terms of the style that he is going to be bringing out, we're going to be seeing mannerism. And this is a artistic style of the high Italian Renaissance that we tend to have some human bodies be a little bit more beefy or pumped up than what they normally would be, like muscles on top of muscles here. Um, and we have this heroic body type that we're going to be seeing in the frescoes that Michelangelo, Michelangelo goes and paints and has, uh, specifically like in his painting, The Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. Um, so you're going to be seeing that. Um, however, he does have that one painting, that one uh, moment where we have the finger of God coming very close to the hand and finger of Adam when Adam is born, the creation of Adam painting. Um, Adam, of course, is still weak. He can't even extend out his finger all the way. Uh, but God is there flying through the sky in some sort of nebulous there. Uh, and it is considered one of the greatest works of religious artwork in the world. Now, Raphael. He is also known as one of the kind of those top three Renaissance artists with Michelangelo and da Vinci. Uh, why? Well, because of the type of paintings he does. He is really uh, able to bring in this tender beauty into his artwork. Um, and the subject sublime in both flesh and spirit. He is somebody that was trained very early on as a painter by his father. And we know that he was trained very young because his father and mother both pass away by the time he is 11. Now he is set up with an apprenticeship, um, but he is somebody who rises also like da Vinci and Michelangelo very quickly in terms of the sheer ability that he has. Uh, he's also known, of course, for his painting, The School of Athens, uh, but very much also known for his paintings of Madonna and Child. So that is the end of us looking at those artists of the Italian Renaissance. Of course, there are oh so many more that I could go into, but for time purposes, these are the ones we're going to be focusing on today. So thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below and always remember to like and subscribe. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.